everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 120 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. In this episode, I visit with Professor Andy Spaulding, who teaches at the Richmond Law School. We explore Andy's debate with Matthew Stevenson of the Global, <coughs> excuse me, Global Anti-Corruption Blog on princelings and hiring of sons and daughters of government officials under the FCPA. We talk about some of the opinion releases, the FCPA guidance, and tie that into a couple of enforcement actions, actions related to charitable donations. The episode comes in at just over 24 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and welcome to this uh, episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me Andy Spaulding, Professor Andy Spaulding, professor at the University of Richmond and uh, a fellow contributor to the FCPA blog, a writer, uh, proliferate, and a commentator on things uh, FCPA related, compliance related, legal related, and many other areas related. So, uh, Andy, thanks a lot for coming on and welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, could you tell us what you're teaching this term? Sure. I teach uh, at the University of Richmond. I teach international business law courses generally, and I teach contracts the first year uh, uh, required course, which I'm teaching this semester. My, my most exciting course this semester is that um, we're doing a year-long class called Brazil, Corruption, and the 2016 Summer Olympics. Wow. We're, we're studying Brazil's uh, anti-corruption initiatives, of which there have been many of the last two years, uh, in the wake of the World Cup particularly. Um, we are writing a preliminary research paper. Um, we are then traveling to Brazil in March to interview uh, government officials, lawyers, NGOs, and such, and hopefully the the, uh, the Rio 2016 committee itself. And then we are coming back and, and collectively writing a paper, which we think can can um, can be a, a can make a good contribution to uh, our understanding of the role of law in limiting corruption related to the Olympics. Well, uh, given what's currently going on in Brazil and uh, <clears throat> the past World Cup and the yes. upcoming Olympics, that is about as exciting place as I think you could be for uh, those issues. So congratulations. Thanks a lot. Brazil is really at an historic time, uh, uh, greatly uh, uh, precipitated by these two athletic events. So it's, it's going to be an exciting story. Well, I ask you to come on because of a blog post you had this week on the FCPA blog where uh, you highlighted a debate you've had, an uh, ongoing debate with Professor Matthew Stevenson and his blog. And uh, so I, of course, had read your four posts earlier this year, uh, specifically around the princeling issue and princessling issue of J.P. Morgan and hirings by various uh, U.S. companies of sons and daughters of Chinese government officials. And you and Professor Stevenson uh, are having quite a, a dialogue going on. And so uh, I thought that it would be a great opportunity to reach out and and ask you to, to talk about uh, that dialogue, some of your analysis, and uh, where you think the policy might go forward. So uh, as uh, I told you uh, before we got started, I probably come down a little bit closer to Professor Stevenson uh, on this, and uh, I actually have a little bit uh, closer to a hard and fast rule of don't ever hire a uh, son and daughter, but uh, I think uh, your position is more nuanced, more and I uh, would ask you just to give us a little bit of background about what you what brought you to commenting on this issue and where you're shaking out on it now. Sure. Well, it's just an inherently interesting issue. And, and if, you, uh, if you have an interest in China, uh, as I have, I've been lucky enough to, to, to do a lot of work there. Um, and and uh, as you think about the way that FCPA issues really uh, come to a head in China in various ways, this is, this is just a, a fascinating issue. Um, I've always been fascinated by the question, um, that, 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 that is based on a distinction between questions of law and questions of policy. Um, as a matter of policy, that is, as a, as a normative question, do we think hiring the sons or daughters of officials should be prohibited by statute? My answer is yes. That's, that's not a hard question. It, that is plainly the kind of quid pro quo that the FCPA and other statutes are trying to prohibit. Um, the, the more interesting question, and the one that Professor Stevens and I have really been arguing about is, how do we read that into the FCPA? That is, not simply should it be illegal, but is it illegal under the FCPA uh, as drafted, or more specifically, as interpreted by the Department of Justice up to now? And those questions are harder. So that if, if I could frame the question um, the way I think it should be, it's how do we get from what the Department of Justice has already said about uh, uh, select provisions of the FCPA? Um, to an interpretation which clearly prohibits 
uh, hiring these officials? And that's, that's, that's a question with a lot of different pieces. Um, one of them has to do with uh, how do we define value? Uh, and the FCPA prohibits giving anything of value. What does value mean? Um, can it be uh, non-monetary? As a matter of policy, yes, but DOJ hasn't said uh, hardly anything about that up to now. And the other is, um, is this consistent with prior opinion releases? And I think that question is very tricky uh, in ways that we'll, we'll surely get to. Uh, perhaps we should set up the, the question that uh, started all of this debate, or the sure. fact pattern, rather. And uh, last year it was announced that uh, J.P. Morgan was under investigation for the hiring of certain yeah. sons and daughters of Chinese mm -hmm. government officials. And uh, it, it turned out that, uh, or at least was reported in the press, that uh, high government officials' sons and daughters were hired, contracts were awarded to J.P. Morgan, and there was an ongoing investigation. There's been some information released in the press, and of course, uh, a lot more that has not been released. So people like uh, yourself and myself have been speculating and right. trying to advise clients on what this may mean for um, the, uh, their programs going forward. So, uh, Matt, now that we've set it up a little more fully, uh, why don't you tell us uh, what you discovered in your research, uh, particularly with the opinion releases and where you think we are today on sure. our analysis? Sure. So, you know, it, it, like much of what happens in the FCPA, we, we, we think of these fact patterns as entirely new, and they're new to the, to the modern era of enforcement. You know, uh, your readers surely know that uh, we enacted the FCPA in the late 70s, but not until about 10 years ago did we really take it seriously. And so the issues that we ha that have arisen in the, the modern era of enforcement um, uh, seem new to us, but occasionally we find that the Department of Justice had actually addressed a similar fact pattern in the past, and that's true with the hiring of relatives. There are two opinion releases. Uh, again, an opinion release is when a client, a, a, uh, a company, goes to the Department of Justice and asks for advice on whether something they're proposing is likely to violate the FCPA. And the Department of Justice will render an opinion, make that opinion public so that it's available for, for others to, to learn from as well. And in the early 80s, we had two examples. Um, the, the, the specific facts are a little bit convoluted and, and not particularly interesting. But the upshot was two examples of uh, companies hiring the relatives of officials uh, and then asking the FCPA, uh, is this uh, likely to violate the FCPA? Uh, and the Department of Justice went through a, a fairly narrow analysis there, which is interesting. In both those, of those releases, they asked, did something of value pass through the hired relative to the official? That is, was the hired relative uh, a, a conduit through which something of value was being funneled to the official? There was no evidence in either case that there was. And the uh, Department of Justice uh, concluded that for that and other reasons, there was no violation. Um, but that's interesting. That analysis implies that the job does not itself have value to the official. The analysis applies that uh, the, the, the hired relative uh, might be a, a medium through which something of value can pass, but the hiring of the relative does not itself have value. Uh, and I think those, those opinion releases are long forgotten if, uh, if we are to find that uh, facts of the sort that we think exist in J.P. Morgan, although you're right, we don't know yet, but if, we th if our understanding of the facts is close to correct, and if we think that uh, that violates the FCPA, we've got to reconcile that with what we said back in the 80s. We've got to come up with a theory of, of, uh, of, of uh, an, uh, an understanding of hiring officials that is uh, consistent with what we said in the 80s. I think we can do that, but I think we've got to work at it. One of the uh, cases, or I should say enforcement action rather, you pointed to in one of your articles was the Sharing Plow case. Yeah. Now that was charitable donations, and that case and the other some other charitable donation cases have intrigued me. Yeah. The Sharing Plow case was a books and records violation, but the two uh, subsequent cases, uh, the uh, Eli Lilly, or specifically the Eli Lilly case, um, was also a books and records case, but in the Eli Lilly case, which amazingly enough involved the same government official with the same charity as Sharing Plow, uh, a, the Director General of the Silesian Healthcare Service in the Polish province of Silesia. In the Lilly case, the SEC was able to match up the donations made, which were relatively small, uh, between two and $7,000, with it to the timing of either a contract 
a reaward of a contract or a contract payment. And when I say timing, I mean generally within 24 hours of a donation. So here we had, with the Lilly case, we had a benefit paid, which was not a monetary benefit to the uh, government official. It was to an established, viable, recognized charity, albeit outside the healthcare industry. And so it seems to me with the Lilly case and charitable donations, we've moved to something of value being perhaps something broader than simply a monetary amount. Well, I think we're, we're moving. I agree with that. How far we've moved down that road, I think, is an open question. Um, if you looked at the guidance, for example, it talks about charitable donations um, and how they can violate the FCPA, but it stops well short of saying uh, uh, non-monetary gifts um, uh, counts as things of value. I think if you read the, the guidance, it is just as easily interpreted, I think more easily interpreted, to say something like, uh, this is kind of a veil piercing analysis and and the official's favorite charity, giving money to the official's favorite charity is just like giving money to the official himself. Right. Uh, okay. That's different than saying, um, we recognize this has absolutely no monetary value to you. Um, uh, but we recognize that it has a, a broader kind of value. Uh, so for example, applying that to the sons and daughters cases, if um, if the company had not given money if, if let's, let's say this, let's say the child was not an adult and financially independent. Let's say the child is young, okay, and the company uh, puts money into some kind of an account to spend on the call on the uh, on the child's college, okay, college education. Would that be a bribe? Well, we think yes, um, but that that's not money going directly to the official. But it's sort of the equivalent because uh, the official has a vested interest in this and is, is financially responsible for this, this child, right? Um, uh, I think a charity might be something closer to that. The problem with the sons and daughters, with the Princeton issue, is that these are f adult financially independent uh, children, by and large. And so I think, it is a, I think it's a, a, one large step, uh, if not more, beyond the charitable donations problem. I think we've got to say that, look, we recognize that this is giving money to somebody whom you are not giving money to, have no intention of giving money to, but, but, but that the, the giving money to this third party has a, has a broader value to you. We can say that. It's consistent with what we've done before, but it's remarkable of how far we've really come short of, of embracing that non-monetary theory of value. And when I uh, walk through my analysis of this, I have to say that I came out about it from a different angle, which sure. was from the company angle, thinking yeah. through how a company would present evidence to regulator, judge and jury, whomever, that they had not engaged in uh, giving anything of value and not violated the act. And so what, uh, and what struck me about the J.P. Morgan case was, if I can use the word exception, that was taken by Morgan to take these sons and daughters out of their normal hiring practice. I've heard a couple of uh, commentators uh, or at least panelists at uh, industry events say that they didn't think the J.P. Morgan case would keep you from hiring a son or daughter, but they had to go through your regular process. And so when an exception is taken by a company, that, to me, was the red flag that something askance was going on. Why were they taken out of their normal hiring process? Why were they given special treatment, special favors? Uh, so that was sort of issue one. The other thing uh, which concerned me about Morgan was apparently there was a spreadsheet uh, yeah. that actually tied. Yeah. <laughs> As I tell people, never put uh, your uh, specifics in the spreadsheets, but they tied the hiring of the sons and daughters to the contracts that were awarded to J.P. Morgan to show the business that, that was brought in by the hiring. So uh, I think that may be, you know, certainly one, one piece of evidence that many companies don't have. But if I can go back to that exception, but it seems to me in listening to you, I was looking at this is what, how does the company disprove yeah. it? And you're looking at it is what does the government have to prove? Well, that, that's certainly for true. You, so you're you're uh, you're advising companies. I'm thinking about this as a, as a law professor. So we have different perspectives. That's that's really interesting. Um, I think the intent of the company should be relevant. The problem is the DOJ hasn't said that yet. The DOJ hasn't said what we're going to look at here is the intention of the company in hiring the relative. Um, 
uh, in the old opinion releases, there was no analysis of intent. Right? There was the, the question wasn't even asked. Well, what was the company's motivation in uh, hiring this relative? Well, that might be because it wasn't even on the table. There was no suggestion that the companies had hired these relatives for that reason. So the so the opinion releases didn't address it. Um, what we have now with J.P. Morgan is a new set of facts, and it might well be that we want to move in the direction of requiring some kind of evidence, uh, and the spreadsheet would certainly suffice, uh, probably suffice, um, that uh, the company was intending to uh, to affect a quid pro quo by hiring these officials. Now, another question, relatedly, is: Do would we need evidence that the official actually regarded it as value? Right. What if, for example, um, the official and the child are utterly estranged, and the company doesn't know this? So the so the company is uh, hiring the official. Excuse me, hiring the relative of the official, hiring the son or daughter, um, assuming that that's going to give them brownie points with the official, but it doesn't. It might even alienate. It might even uh, 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 irritate or upset the official. Would we still call that a violation of the FCPA? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if we need, uh, Professor Stevenson uh, suggested that, that he'd want evidence of both, both that the company intended this to be something of value to the official and that the, that, that the official regarded it as something of value. I don't know if, 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 we want, if we need to go that far, and I say that honestly, I haven't thought that through yet, but, um, but I certainly agree that the subjective intent of, of somebody is, is going to have to be relevant here. And, that's, and, and I would hope that the, 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 the government uh, is looking for evidence and will use that evidence um, and rely on it uh, in, in, its, in its decision. Well, as uh, the criminal portion of the uh, FCPA, I believe, requires an intent, it has an intent requirement. Right. So that, right. Um, right. But right. advising companies, what I argue is you need to negate that intent. Ah. And you need to have evidence that you've negated yeah. that intent. Yeah. And so when people talk about going through your regular process, whatever your vetting is, whatever your interview process is, whatever your testing process is, whatever your credentialing process is, uh, if you make an exception for that, that exception has to be documented and it needs to be explained uh, yeah. why you've created those exceptions. And that's how you dislink any intent from your yeah. action. And that's right. what I try to emphasize. Right. No, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely important. And as I'm, I'm talking about... Uh, the soundness of the legal analysis here. You know, let to make no mistake, uh, companies should stay a million miles away from this. You, you don't even want to. You don't want to be the client that's raising these questions to the Department of Justice. You want to stay well clear of these ambiguities uh, because they will frequently be resolved against you. Uh, let me see if I could turn to a, a little bit different uh, focus of one of the points you've raised, which is the greater policy argument about yeah. uh, FCA precedent. What we as practitioners, you as a law professor. Uh, companies perhaps can look uh, to for guidance. Uh, we've had some opinion releases, sometimes uh, up to four a year, sometimes as little as none a year. We have the FCPA guidance. We've got a very minimal amount of court cases. Uh, but you've really focused on the uh, opinion releases and how we or should use them going forward. So why don't we uh, visit a little bit about that? Sure. Happy to. So. Uh, uh, if you uh, end up talking about the FCPA, um, uh, in other cultures, uh, other countries, if you've uh, taught classes or done lectures or anything like that, you'll wind up saying that the FCPA is designed to promote the rule of law. And what do we mean by that? We mean that the law is written down, is transparent, uh, it's applied consistently. Um, it, it can the, the the manner in which the law will be applied to a certain individual uh, should be knowable in advance to the extent possible. Um, that the law will change and evolve, but gradually and incrementally and through legitimate procedures. Uh, and so, uh, as a law professor, I ask, not just as a matter of policy, as I said before, what should the law do? I also ask, is this consistent with how we've interpreted the law before? And uh, one of the really curious things about the FCPA from a lawyer's perspective, much less a law professor's perspective, is that what we don't have are judicial decisions. And in our system of law, judicial decisions are absolutely crucial to developing law. The way these decisions work is that courts review uh, the, uh, the, the opinions, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the interpretations of the SCPA uh, that the government has given, and, uh, and 
arrives at its independent conclusions, writes those down, those become law, and those become guidance to the rest of us. That's critical, and we don't get much of it in the FCPA because of the the uh, the, the the habit of selling these cases through uh, deferred prosecution and non-prosecution agreements. So the opinion releases are the next best thing, and and they aren't law. They make that clear. They're not designed to be binding on absolutely binding on future parties. Uh, there's a, a disclaimer in these uh, opinion releases to that extent. Nonetheless, the reason we publish them uh, is to provide guidance. Uh, the reason we have guidance is to provide guidance. And so we have to make sure that we're being consistent with that guidance. We can't have advised, the government cannot um, uh, give one set of, of recommendations through the opinion releases or the guidance and then interpret uh, a, a subsequent set of facts with a particular client, a particular defendant, in a way that's just outright inconsistent with what it said before. Um, that's crucial. And so that's why I'm making a big deal of these opinion releases that are, that are at this point, um, 30 years old. Um, we have to make sure we're being consistent with those, um, not to mention the very recent guidance. So if, if there has been evolution uh, beyond yeah. what was uh, opined in yeah. the early to mid 80s, uh, would you have any, any thoughts, if not suggestions, on what the, the department, the government might do to communicate to us um, you need to reevaluate this, or perhaps this uh, we are reevaluating this. What would you yes. suggest? Yes, yes. So, so I think uh, 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 the department, of course, speaks most loudly through enforcement actions. I think that's fair to say. And um, and if it if it is going to um, announce to the world through this J.P. Morgan case that um, the hiring officials of uh, the hiring of the sons or daughters of officials can violate the FCPA. It needs to make very clear that um, it's doing that because there is specific evidence of intent, right? Uh, and uh, in those opinion releases, again, there wasn't an intent analysis. It simply was, um, we don't think of these jobs as things of value to the official. Um, if the DOJ now wants to amend that holding and say, well, we don't think of these jobs as things of value to the official unless the the, uh, the jobs were uh, there's evidence that the jobs were given to the relatives of the official to get a quid pro quo. That's consistent, but it's a big additional step. And I and I would hope that the Department of Justice, um, if it comes down that way with J.P. Morgan, uh, it articulates a rule in the settlement documents that is clear for all of us to see, so that uh, your clients and the rest of the world can know exactly how the DOJ is going to uh, interpret. Uh, this thing of value provision um, going forward. Uh, one of the things that I always uh, uh, learned and said as a tr trial lawyer was uh -huh. that bad facts make bad law. <laughs> and uh, when a, there's a dramatic change in the law, it's generally because the facts are very bad and the court was uh, went through machinations to get to the result it wanted, but it had to put some law out there that was at least different than yeah. the prior law. And it may be that the facts... Of J.P. Morgan are so stark yeah. that we yeah. we make that step uh, yes. because the facts were so bad and the department uh, can 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 get there quite easily, or at least there's a straight line for them to get there. So yeah. Um, yeah. you know it may be that as well. Yes, um, I think there is a straight line. I think it's a long line. Right. And I just and I hope that the Department of Justice articulates it very clearly and um, recognizes. Um, that it is making quite a big jump. It's, 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 it's a sustainable jump, I agree with you, but it is, it's, it is a, it's a big step. Well, uh, we're at the end of our time. I neglected to mention that uh, Matthew Stevenson's blog is the Global Anti-Corruption blog. If you haven't checked it out, you definitely need to do yeah. so. It's a great addition to our uh, little commentariat. Uh, if uh, anyone wanted to contact you, could they email you and uh, follow up with you? Please do. I'm at the University of Richmond School of Law. You can Google me. Uh, uh, my, my email address is ASPALDIN at richmond.edu. And uh, I love talking about these issues. Happy to do so with anybody, particularly practitioners, who, uh, you know, clients out there who are seeing things that uh, we academics uh, uh, don't always get to see and love to hear about. Well, great. Well, I really appreciate you visiting with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs>